I V M. This is Audio Gyan, and I am your host Kedar Nimkar. Welcome to a deep dive into the minds of luminaries from the Indian creative world. Today we have S Vishwanath with us on Audio Gyan. He's a water activist, the mind behind Bangalore-based NGO Rainwater Club, a visiting faculty at School of Development at Azim Premji University. He's a civil engineer and an urban regional planner by training, and has been working in the field of water and sanitation sector for over thirty-five years. I'm so honored to have you, Vishwanath, on Audio Gyan. Thanks for giving us your time, and yeah, welcome to the show. Pleasure, Kedar. Yeah, so I requested uh, you to come on Audio Gyan after hearing a fascinating podcast on Puliyawazi, as in Puliyawazi podcast. I have uh, mentioned that in the show notes, and obviously the extent of which uh, you can speak about uh, water. Uh, if I have to draw a parallel, is almost like an ocean. So I thought I'll just keep this episode a bit deep and narrow, like the well. So basically, understanding how our wells designed. So yeah, let's I- let's. <laughs> That's a fascinating history, and we can do enough on the well itself, uh, Kedar. <laughs> yeah. Water is an ocean, but a well is deep enough, as you put it rightly. Correct, correct. Yeah. So I've come up with few questions, and to begin with, um, like if we can start at a more meta level, like how do you define a well? I mean, we have different sorts of reservoirs in India. There are few in Rajasthan, step well, and other stuff. So, like, is there any classical definition of a well? Is there supposed to be like some source of water, some spring? Like how do you define it classically and contemporary maybe? Yeah, well, a well is just a hole in the ground which taps into something called an aquifer from where you draw water, and an aquifer itself can be imagined as a sponge where you pour water, it holds on to the water and it is capable of releasing it. Right. So, basic hole in the ground is a well. We've gone on to line it with bricks and stone in some places, and then we've gone on to give it architectural uh, definition through those beautiful step wells and wells of Gujarat and Rajasthan. But at its basic, dig a hole in the ground. If you strike water, that's a well. Okay. But how do you then strike? As in like, I'm going to come to that point uh, later on about the Manu Vadas. But then how do you know that there's water here? Because it, the water could be anywhere, right? Yeah, but this is fascinating because I think one of the things with a well, which is uh, classic about it, is that it's only found in certain places, right? You've got to figure out which places they are. And this is a science behind it and a technology behind it. But the well itself as a construct is about 9,000 years old. The oldest well we have found is 9,000 to 9,500 years old. It's back in, in Cyprus, in that island of Cyprus, and in Israel and in Jordan. Right? So at some point of time, human beings figured out that if you could go into the ground and dig a hole, you would find water. Now, this liberated you from the tyranny of rivers and lakes. Now, the countryside was yours for you to go explore, occupy, and you could just dig a hole in the ground and get the water you needed for survival. So the first great conquest of human beings of the countryside, of the development of agriculture, starts with wells. And you ask the question, where do you dig for a well? I think the earliest human beings also asked that question, where do we dig for a well? Perhaps the first wells were dug around river plains, river beds in summertime, or near the seashore, or close to lakes, right? Where you're guaranteed water, most probably a riverbed, you know, uh, you dug a hole and then you found water. And then you figured that you could perhaps dig it on the side of the river and find water. And then it started to become a science of its own. And then we'll delve into what the science of it is and how do we figure out where to dig for a well at a later stage. But to remind ourselves that the oldest civilizations in India, the one in Kiladi in Tamil Nadu, the Indus Valley civilization, the Harappa Mohenjo-Daros, all of them are named after rivers, but actually they survived on wells. Mohenjo-Daro, for example, every third house had a well. Harappa had wells, and so on and so forth, right? So wells were functionally what kept human civilization going for a long, long time and have not got their due because they have been sort of confused with rivers and lakes and other things. Mm-hmm. And, and why did you say tyranny of rivers? Because at least in India, we worship rivers. So uh, is there like some connect there? Hey, it's a play on words. The tyranny of the river is that mm. it ties you to its boundaries or banks, right? Then mm. you figured out where the water is from a well or a spring, mm. you could not leave the river and go away for more than 24 hours. You have to come back because you needed water for survival. And if you need water for survival, you can't survive with, without uh, water in the countryside, in the surroundings, right? So mm. you would have, for example, lakes or 
talaos or ponds, but these would tend to go dry in summer times, and especially if there were years of drought. So the river's tyranny is that it holds it holds you to itself. The, mm-hmm. the civilizationally it holds you, but the well liberates you because now you go to the earth. The earth is holding the water for you, stocking it up below the ground, preventing evaporation to occur, keeping it filtered, keeping it sweet, and it releases it if you have the knowledge to dig where you have to dig. Interesting. And and you said uh, digging close to the banks or close to uh, certain huge body water bodies. There are these peculiar trees also, right? Which uh, which gives which signifies that there could be water potentially here, irrespective of like it's far away from some huge water body. Is there yeah. any? Hmm. It's common sense. Like uh, when you go in summer to a countryside and you see that the tree is green, obviously the tree is drawing water uh, from a, from the ground, from underground. Hmm. So its roots have gone to the aquifers. Typically roots are 20 to 30 feet deep. Only rarely do trees send in a tap root 50 to 60 feet deep. Most trees' uh, roots are 10 20 feet, thereabouts. So if you saw a green tree in summertime, then you would be sure that there was an aquifer below. If you saw a termite mound, a mantel, and termites need water all the time. So a termite mound would signify water below, right? Certain bushes, like the calotropes, you know, the ark, they call it, or yucca, it's the milkweed. You, know? you cut the leaf and you get milk from it. This is a plant which was identified with groundwater. So typically, if you have these in a straight line, termite mounds and trees which are green in summer and the scalotropis, then you would dig below there and you would generally strike water. So studying the landscape, understanding soil, understanding trees and plants was essential to determine where to dig for a well. Mm, that's interesting. So yeah, if you can like tell us what's the importance of wells uh, for civilization in general. I mean, yeah, it's it's like, I mean, I have a follow-up question on that, which is what I uh, just mentioned about rivers were worshipped, but every house had a well or every other house had a well. So, Correct. and you also spoke about the entire, actually don't recollect the exact thing, but it also spun from the, the bullock cart and bunch of other oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. so if you can give like some background about that. Well, the well is human beings' first efforts to access water. Before that, nature provided us, provided us water right? from streams and springs and rivers and lakes. Nature was providing us water and from rain, if you collected it. But the first time human beings put in an effort was with the well to access water. And therefore, that history started, as I was describing to you, the science of water itself. Because what is science but codified knowledge? And codified knowledge is transmitted from generation to generation. And that generational knowledge was where do you dig for a well? Right, So I would argue that uh, science develops around wells and water. Witt Fogel, a very famous uh, philosopher, scientist, uh, had uh, suggested that civilization is actually constructed around water, called the hydraulic civilization as a model. That's been debunked a bit, but then his argument was that the structure of the state or governance itself is created around water because you have to arrange a bureaucracy to manage water at, at, at some levels. That was Witt Fogel's argument. But my argument is that a well was the first scientific construct and the first human endeavor to um, access water. And like I was telling you, it liberated us from the tyranny of rivers and lakes and allowed us the countryside to explore. And perhaps the first agricultures developed around, around wells and the science of water developed around wells. But wells also spun technologies. Human beings by nature are lazy. They want to put in minimum effort for maximum rewards. So obviously, at a point of time, the well water would have gone down and you want to figure out how to draw the water. So you invented the rope. The rope was okay to lift at, but things could be made a bit more easier. Suppose you had a pot or a bucket, which was 10 kgs or 20 kgs. That's a heavy load already. So you thought you put a stick between a Y4 and roll the rope on it, right? That makes mechanical advantage. So you lift water easier. That spoke became the pulley. Mm-hmm. The pulley made it so possible that a small girl could lift water. And then it had the gender ramifications. because Girls then became in charge of water and so on and so forth. But the pulley then got attached to two, two spokes and became the bullock cart. Then it got attached to two wheels and it became the horse cart and therefore machines of war. The pulley got attached to the automobile and became part of the car Excellent. transportation. Yeah. 
And the pulley therefore resulted in the first traffic jam in the world, which is ascribed to cars. But it's not cars, but it's the well, which is the cause for the <laughs> traffic jams that we face now in Pune, Bombay, or Bangalore for that matter. So a whole bunch of technologies developed around the well, including the lever, you know, the what is called the yeta or the fork, whereby you lift the water, human beings can run on it and tip it up and then lift the water. The pulley, which became the Persian wheel, where bullets would go round and round and the Persian wheel would lift a chain of buckets up in with water, the first pump, so to say. So science and technology have anchored themselves around the well civilizationally. Very interesting point. Just one more point, Kedar. Hmm. Civilizations which have had the well have developed the wheel. Only civilization and the continuous civilization at that is a 50,000 to 65,000 year old one of the ancient people of Australia who were cut off from the rest of the world by Australia being an island. They did not have the well or very few wells. And they as a civilization never developed the wheel. So is it a coincidence? Up for us as a hypothesis to explore. But the well caused the wheel to develop and the wheel caused automation, transportation to develop. And therefore, there is something great about the well, which mm. really fascinates me. Yeah. I mean, we'll certainly come to this point again because if the well caused the industrial revolution, so maybe the electricity has also depleted wells now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but uh, so, so you mentioned that uh, like the earliest well, which we have sort of uh, figured out so far is like 9,000. Uh, so, and and I don't exactly, can't place it in the timeline, but civil, uh, agriculture must have not been that old, right? It It's slightly younger than this. So, so any anything happened between the first well discovered or the first well invented to the time when agriculture started? Any insights? Well, one of the first furrows discovered that shows agriculture being practiced is in Kalibanga, in the Indus Valley Civilization. That's one of the first furrows there. And that's about 5,000 years old, right? Mm. Roughly 5,000 5, years old. So therefore, of course, the oldest well predates the oldest furrow. But mostly agriculture would have been rain-fed in the beginnings. You just scattered seeds or you just picked it up. But organized agriculture had to work around water. And I would argue that the well was one of the supports of that organized agriculture. It could have been diversion of rivers through barrages and anicuts, but it could possibly also have been around wells. And possibly the Harappan people were uh, one of the first to use well water for, uh, for agriculture, what you would call irrigation now as a practice. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. It's a topic not being researched enough. There's been a lot done on water and a lot done on rivers and other things. But the well itself, unfortunately, few scholars have spent time in understanding the dynamics of the well. Mm, okay, yeah. And, and PhDs can come around. <laughs> yeah, it's worth exploring, definitely. And, and are there different types of wells uh, in India? I mean, with respect yeah. to water, with respect to structure, with respect to any, any brief there? Yeah, yeah. So broadly, typology-wise, you would have the Indo-Gangetic Basin, where the water table is very high, or used to be very high. Now it's deflating very fast. But here, the soil is sandy or loamy, and therefore you need a support structure for the well, which is completely a brick plastered well, right? So the brick goes all around, and the whole thing is plastered. And the water comes from the bottom. So well is fed from the bottom, the aquifer feeds it from the bottom. Whereas in the Deccan Plateau, both in basalt areas and in granite grease areas, rocky areas, two-thirds of India, the well is generally lined with stones, basalt stones or granite or grease. And these are sort of uncemented, without lime or without cement, and they're porous. Water comes in from the sides as much as it does from the bottom. So these are the broad two typologies for wells. Fascinating wells, which are there with, uh, for example, pottery line wells in Odisha and Bengal, which has also transferred to Sri Lanka. And the modern well is being done with concrete rain. So these are the sort of broad typologies of the open well. Mm-hmm. And and these were designed or these were like, they organically were evolving based on the typology or topology or uh, were they like looking at the topology, we took conscious efforts to evolve them? So here's the fascinating thing. Because of the stone structure or the soil quality and stuff like that. Yeah, basically the old wells were unlined wells, right? So they were they were not lined, but they were prone to collapse depending on the, the soil conditions and the weathered rock conditions. So, But then a set of uh, communities developed around the construction of the well. The Manwadars that I was talking about or the Bowie mm-hmm. or the Ode as they are called. So these people were skilled in digging deep and making sure that the well was reached. 
But they had a cousin community called the Kaluvadas or the stone cutters. And the stone cutters would cut the stones for the Manuvadas to line the well. Right? So mm-hmm. community and social practice developed around typology of the well. And as people figured out what made it more robust, more stable, they started to develop the practice of using lime and brickwork and stones to line the wells, especially the richer farmers. The poorer farmers would still leave it unlined and it would be prone to collapse and so on and so forth. But mm-hmm. as the agricultural communities grew in richness, then the well started to get lined, started to get decorated. And the apogee of it was reached when rulers or people with great money started to design those step wells, the Rani Kivas and the Chan Bodies and other things. Mm-hmm. And and is there any um, reason why we generally have like sweet water or or we have a peculiar water, right, for the wells? So so how like how does it acquire that quality? Is it naturally in the groundwater or is it because of the structure? Yeah, so it's a characteristic of the soil. Now the rainwater falls, seeps through the ground, picks up minerals, and then the well taps into this water. And so generally what people would do is avoid places with high salt, what is called sodic land or sodic soil. They would go to places where the well water was sweet. That's how civilization developed. Because if it's salty water, then obviously you can't drink it and uh, the plants and the crops don't love it because salt buildup in soil will result in crop cultivation being dampened, right? Mm. So, but not to say many places, the water was khara or salty. People still lived with it. They gave it that name, kharapani, kuwa. Mm. So those names also came associated with the quality of the water, but that's a characteristic of the soil and the characteristic of the place. Mm. It's so fascinating. I mean, just everything is so naturally setting up perfectly. Some of the sweetest water is in the deserts of Rajasthan, right? Uh, where perhaps the, uh, the Saraswati has disappeared below the desert sands. And mm. in places like Jaisalmer, Jodhpur, you have Kuwas which are 100, 120 feet deep and they have absolutely the sweetest water in certain patches. In certain patches close by, you can see salt water. So perhaps ancient river courses are being defined by wells now where they're tapping into sweet water too. So these are fascinating constructs around the quality of the well water. Mm-hmm. One is of the fascinating thing is that uh, well waters generally did not have fluoride and arsenic, generally. Right? Mm-hmm. So fluoride and arsenic came with the bore wells and uh, that has been a problematic. Well waters would have the guinea worm, would have bacteria, but not fluoride and arsenic, not geogenic contaminations like that. So that's an, another peculiar characteristic. Mm-hmm. But isn't, like, I, I'm sorry for a naive question, but isn't bore well a sort of modernized well? I mean, you just put like a thing. So how, like, any anything to know about? So what an open well does is it taps into something called a shallow, unconfined aquifer. That's the first weathered rock or the soil zone. Hmm. where the water is. So you dig and the water table is up for you to see. A bore well can tap into the same aquifer, but bore wells generally go deeper into what's called confined or semi-confined aquifer. That is water between two rock layers, which is pressed together and kept together. So bore wells go deep into that and then pick up generally what would be called fossil water or water which has been stocked up over a long, long time. Though now it's getting recharged by rainwater, but wells pick up water which is annually replenished Bore wells pick up water, which is decades old or centuries old, broadly to say. Wow. Mm. And it can so happen that when you start digging, you will first probably stumble upon like kharapani and then sweet pani. It can happen like that? It can happen. It can happen because it depends on the, uh, the soil characteristic and the rock characteristic. Whereas the, the confined aquifers or the semi-confined aquifers may be fed from a long distance, right? And they may have sweet water. Whereas the soil itself may be salty and therefore you would have salt water on the top. Right? So that's also possible. In many places, that's also seen. Mm-hmm. Wow. So maybe we can come to this Manu Vadas uh, uh, where they they knew where to dig or probably figured out. Can you tell us about this community, like how they used to, uh, slightly detailed, how they used to figure out and then like how, with the, the, was there like a excavation, like today we see just JCPs <laughs> digging something. How are these guys uh, doing it? I'll, I, I've attached a few links uh, of uh, from your blog post, but if you can just talk about it a bit, like how do these... Or, or there are more communities doing this in earlier times? Generally, the digging of wells and the digging of tanks was with this community, right? the old community. They were an itinerant community. They would move from place to place, carrying their skills. And their skill was the soil, digging with soil. So they would just use basic tools to dig for soil. 
And because uh, they had developed this from generation to generation, one of the things, for example, is that they have broad shoulders and are capable of digging even in the hardest of soil very quickly, right? And they can climb up the well using a rope very quickly. Not easy to climb up 20 feet, 30 feet using a rope, right? Those things come with the trade and the practice, but they move from place to place. Uh, so, and they're uh, quite a strange community in the sense they are not fixed to a geography. Now, nowadays they are, but previous times the British used them to dig the upper Yamuna Canal, the upper Ganga Canal, right? The first of the first Ganga and Yamuna Canal. And they write in their books, they complain that this community would just up and go if there was some incident of a disease or whether they had to pray to their goddess or something of that sort. They would just, the whole camp would move off, right? Hmm. So that has been the characteristic of the community. But their ability to dig is phenomenal. And uh, even now in Bangalore, when we work with these uh, communities, a team of four or five can finish off a well in one day. You know, a well wow. which is 20 to 30 feet deep and about three feet diameter, they can dig that in one day, depending on the soil. So it's a typical Indian way of associating a particular trade and a particular skill with a particular community. That's been refined here. Mm-hmm. So their tools have been always the same all along or is there... It's the uh, basic of tools. It's just the basic. It's something like a javelin, which you call Galapari, they call it in Canada. They have different yeah. names for it. It's just that. Uh, and Fawda, um, they call it in Maharashtra and other places, which is just a spade, which they just take the wall. That's it. Just basic tools. Wow. And a rope. And a rope to go down and go up. But they have refined the knowledge a lot now. For example, they know to clean old wells. And before they clean old wells, they'll put in a lit lamp to make sure that the gases in the well are not there, right? So if the lamp goes out, then there's carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. That skill they have. Uh, They know how to handle silt if it's loose soil below the ground. They know how to be careful about it. And in luckily, touch wood uh, with the communities that have been working in Bangalore, dug more than 200,000 wells, and there's not been a single accident. Because they know the soil, they know the water, they know the gases, they know what it's all about. Unfortunately, this traditional knowledge is fast disappearing. Mm-hmm. And they just dig and, and move on, right? Uh, so so the, the line work or the brick work, are they interested in that? Or they're just like helping you find water and then just leave? <laughs> now, because precast concrete rings have come, so they would help you to put those precast concrete rings and line it, right? Mm. Before, that lining work was that of another community. And, and the what was that? That's called the Kalu waders or the stone waders. Uh, Wadder uh, comes from the etymology to break, word, to break, right? Mm. So they're breaking soil or breaking stone. And those that community would provide the stones for lining the well. That's how it goes. Interesting. It's very fascinating. Okay, let's take a short break here. We'll be right back. Hey, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On the Filter Coffee podcast, Karthik speaks with Shriya Sundaresan, co-founder of data-led climate organization Transition Zero. They discuss using data science and financial modeling to fight climate change. It's tough to be a comedian or satirist in India today, but Akash Banerjee is thriving. Check out this year ender episode of The Wire Talks where he joins Siddharth to sum up 2021. This week on Probation Set Promotion Talk, Abhino talks about some basic tips to negotiate a good salary. On The Longest Constitution, Priya takes us through the issue of entitlement and reservations at the workplace, especially when it comes to caste hierarchies and sexual harassment. On The Habit Coach podcast, Ashwin is joined by Sonali Sabarwal. She's a macrobiotic nutritionist and they discuss how Vipassana meditation can help us get over stress and deal with other mental health issues. Do follow us on social media where IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, do tell a friend. The word of mouth absolutely is essential to us. Don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms that you've been listening to. And also, I'd like to ask everybody to check us out on YouTube. We have a number of channels going. You can find all of them on ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Cred, Bank of Baroda, CoinSwitch, Kuber, and Intel. Thank you so much for making this possible. Okay, welcome back to the show. So, this digging of wells or or generally uh, having the main source of water uh, being wells uh, for household use and and probably personal use, I would say. Is this a pattern mainly of India uh, or any tropical belts or is it uh, across the globe? 
it's global it's global but india is one of the largest uh, civilizations or nations dependent on groundwater for example now we have uh, um, 35 million to 40 million wells in bore wells uh, including bore wells now and we take out 250 cubic kilometers of groundwater annually now which is uh, combined greater than china and usa for number 2 and number 3 together china and usa take out 220 cubic kilometers we take out 250 cubic kilometers just wow. as one nation right uh-huh. so we have been a groundwater dependent uh, society and civilization from the harappan times with open well to now with the bore wells and the groundwater and aquifers and therefore what we have evolved as a tradition is very very indian in the sense of the community digging these wells it's very indian but wells themselves are ubiquitous they are there all across the world mm-hmm. and any like not exactly remember but any back story of like why did we then worship rivers when wells were like providing us everything uh, well strangely enough we worship wells uh, so for example in kodugu different communities worship wells at different points of time in kodugu the kodavas worship the kaveri in the form of the well because the kaveri river is their holy river they say for life and legend but if you're far away from the kaveri the well replaces the kaveri so there's a ganga puja offered to the kaveri through the well right mm-hmm. so wells are part of worship you know and there's an annual festival almost everywhere all around india for that from a religious point of view but on the other hand wells have also been caste constructs right so wells have been dug for a particular caste higher castes have dominated certain wells lower castes were not allowed to use the water that kind of caste discrimination also exists with the wells though the waters of the aquifer are one but through the well we have started to discriminate using caste too historically speaking now nowadays it's luckily getting less and less and is going there so it's a strange construct of the spiritual the religious but also the caste uh, into this whole thing business mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah speaking about that that disparity uh, you gave a brilliant uh, analogy of wells being like a straw right uh, to suck ground water for personal use and and when i look at from that lens you generally don't want to share a straw with some stranger right uh, in a in a uh, so yeah. so are there any pros and cons or uh, like any any more to this thought than you me like some other community or some other family is not using my straw is there i i like the analogy that's why yeah yeah so i talk about the analogy the straw analogy comes more with the bore wells but with the well here's the thing it's a functional device which provides you water right but it's also a great communicator so the well is telling you that summer is coming water tables are starting to fall down so use me wisely and sparsely because water as a resource is running out right so you change your behavior based on the resource availability don't expect the resource to change its behavior based on your standards of whatever consumption right so the well is functional and communicative then it tells you that there's been a good year of rain it's full brimful use it plenty it rewards you for good behavior if you make a lake or a percolation pond nearby and recharge the aquifer the well is full it's rewarding you for good behavior you dump garbage and pollutants all around then the well is contaminated it punishes you for bad behavior right so civilizationally and culturally it's sending you a signal almost on a daily basis i know of a lot of gentlemen here uh, and women who go to the well on a daily basis and they communicate with the well they take their granddaughter and show her the well and tell her measure the level of the water hear the sound of the bucket because that's how one way of identifying how deep the water is because sometimes you can't see the water so then you multiply it by 9.81 or whatever is meter per second is the velocity of sound and then you figure out what is the depth of the water right so it's teaching you physics so this communication and functional angle is what we have lost with the tap because with the tap we don't know where the water is coming from how much water is there in the dam or river how long it will last us we want our 135 liters per capita per day or 150 liters per capita per day how do we get back the signals with water as a scarce resource is our big challenge and the metaphor is the well so we got to use uh, go back to the culture of the well metaphorically speaking whereas communication and ecological scarcity of the resource is known to every consumer so that they make a wise choice about how much water to use or how much not to use. that's the parable of the well the straw business is this aquifer is limited yeah so whatever is there below the ground this is very difficult for people to understand the difference between the well and the aquifer the well is a straw to tap into the aquifer the aquifer is can be big can be small depends on the characteristics of geology of that place so can i just for simplicity to visualize the aquifer is sort of the bed is what you are talking about 
It's a sponge bed below the. It's a, it's a sponge bed which is probably running across uh, just below like few feet, a uh, few like meters down the main crust of the so, earth. Broadly in hard rock terrain, you can assume it to run to about 20 to 40 feet or 60 feet. Yeah. And it can be small. It can be just half a square kilometer or sometimes it can be 50 kilometers. So that depends on wow. the plane. Uh-huh. Right? So it can be. And in the Indo-Gangetic plane, it can run hundreds of kilometers. Also. And it's not, yeah. it's not linear as in, because these days for new mind, it's like, there is like this MIDC and some pipes running across from cities to cities, right? So there's no connect as such. It could just end in the middle of nowhere. Broadly, um, aquifers of what are called sub-aquifers would be limited. It won't run into hundreds of kilometers, the mm-hmm. sub-aquifers, especially the shallow, unconfined sub-aquifer. Mm-hmm. The generally plushed aquifer end up very small, right? So, But we are trying to understand, India has launched a major program to try and understand the aquifers and sub-aquifers and map it at scale. It's called the Atal Bhujal Yojana. Through that, we are trying to understand it. We are still far away from it. It's going to take us some time to understand it granularly. But it's critical that we understand it. Now, the parable of the straw. The straw, we are sending into the aquifer. So think of it as a coconut. We are slipping in 10, 20, 30 straws and taking out all the water from the coconut, right? We have to flip it around. We have to put one straw to take the water out and put 50 straws to feed the coconut. So therefore, we make something now called a recharge well. A recharge well takes rainwater from the rooftop or from stormwater drain, filters it, makes sure it's not contaminated, and puts it back into the well into the aquifer. So it put, puts it back into the coconut. Wise communities are those which draw water from one well and put 50 recharge wells. Hmm. Foolish communities are those which put 50 straws to draw the water out and make one or none, no recharge wells. Right? So we have to go back to the parable of the straw and make sure that what we recharge is at least 1.5 times what we take out. That is what will cause sustainability to us. Because we have to remember, it's the aquifer. It's not only providing us water from from the well, but it's the aquifer which is feeding the rivers. Only if the groundwater table is full and high, will water flow into rivers during summertime. Mm. If the groundwater table is very low, then rivers start feeding the aquifer. And therefore, rivers run dry in summertime. Why rivers are dry in the Indian subcontinental plateau is because aquifers have been depleted too much. The well is telling you what is the level of the aquifer. If your well is full, your river can be full. If your well is dry, there's very little chance of the river running with water. It may run, especially during the monsoons, for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. But during summertime, being fed with the uh, with the aquifer, it's not going to run. So the well is signaling to you many, many things. We'd better listen to the well. We'd better learn from the well. And we'd better learn to respect the well and the aquifer. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's sort of that safety tank which you have, which gives you a lot more indicators of the outside uh, actual swimming pool, maybe. <laughs> exactly. And not only that, it's a barometer. It's like a thermometer, right? It's telling you yeah. the health of the ecosystem. So if mm. the well water table falls below, you know, let's say 40, 50 feet, even forests will dry up because the roots of trees can only go 20, 30, 40 feet. They can't go deeper wow. than that. Yeah. So wells near forests are telling you the health of the forest. Wells are talking about the health of the rivers. Wells are, wells are talking about the health of the aquifer and the water itself. So that's why we need to understand it better and learn to respect it. Not do puja one day uh, in 365 days, but do it every day. Right? Yeah. That culture of respect of the well has to become a daily thing for us. Mm. But what is stopping from rains naturally filling it? I mean, do we, why do we have to do this extra effort of refilling very consciously? Right. So here's the thing. Uh, Typically, when rain falls in semi-arid India, two-thirds of India is semi-arid, where we get only about 700 to 800 millimeters of rainfall, only about 10% of the water actually percolates down below one meter and reaches the aquifer. Rest of the water, the soil is already very thirsty, right? The one meter of soil. So it holds on to the rain and quickly evaporates it or evapotranspires it. Bushes and shrubs, they just bring up the water and send it. So only 10% at most, 10% 10% is even a high number. Sometimes it's 3 to 8%. Only that much goes into the aquifer. Mm. As we build up cities, for example, we are starting to pave the land. We build roads, we put buildings, we pave the area around the buildings, and we make what is called a crust. That crust does not allow even that 3 to 8% or 10% to infiltrate into the ground. We stopped that, right? So therefore, we need to understand 
uh, how much water actually infiltrates into the aquifer and we need to try and increase it. Because now we have knowledge of the aquifers. So through making tanks and lakes and percolation ponds and recharge wells, we can increase the amount of water that we can infiltrate into the ground and build up that. That's the better thing to do, right? So that's what we are trying to do. But as we build it up, we must also respect demand and not draw too much water. Simply because we filled the aquifer doesn't give us a right to overexploit it. We have to live within the limit of nature. This year it has rained 700 mm, you are entitled to 70 mm of water. Next year it rained 1000 mm, you are entitled to 100 mm. So on and so forth. Every year there's a credit. To maintain the ratio. Debit. Yeah. Credit, debit. The bank passbook or the balance should be positive. It should be black. It should not go red. Wow. It's so, I mean, I was um, like, I have two thoughts here and I can see the connect, but uh, uh, last episode with Manjima Chatterjee, she was speaking about um, how they're teaching children about climate change through the Noah of Ark and the Matsya uh, Avatar and stuff like that. And it's sort of scary because I could connect the dot saying maybe the Matsya Avatar and those things are pointing that we came as civilization through water. And with climate change, maybe the water levels are rising and we are just going there again and it's going to be end. <laughs> so that's one. And the second is uh, this, I think I saw in one of the series uh, in Tamil Nadu, there is, there was uh, like tsunami, almost like abundant water, like Madhav, it's, it's crazy water. And within next three to five years, there was like almost drought. So why can't we like really like what's, what's the gap? Where's the gap? Why can't we really store these water things which happen every year and not the tsunamis but yeah <laughs> yeah so one of the things in, uh, in chennai for example with the floods in chennai was of course the destruction of the wetlands and the drainage channels and we just made sure that there's no space for water to be you know lakes have been occupied canals have been occupied wetlands have been occupied so there's no place for water to go and it's on the coastline uh, so the high tide level and if there's heavy rain with all these things gone, then you have a crisis. But let's take a city like Bangalore, which is at 920 meters above sea level. Right? Mm. It has no excuse for it to be flooded. Even then, Bangalore is also still flooded. Right? Mm. Uh, and we find areas which are waterlogged and flooded. This is incredible stupidity because we don't know how to deal with water. And I'll tell you why. What happens? Our master plans, our building bylaws, do not respect aquifer. What's happened? We are allowing single, twice, three, four-story basement parkings. Sometimes I've seen in buildings here, in Delhi, in here, that when they're digging, these big builders are digging, they pump water from the aquifer six months to one year continuously, throw fresh water, sweet water out into the ground because they have to do basement parking, then they will concrete it and make sure that cars are parked. So cars are not only evil when they're moving around, throwing their fumes, but evil when they're parked also. Because they demand space below the earth and there's a permanent damage to the aquifer. Next, there are the metros. Now, we think metros which are running below the ground, public transport, all well and good. But unless thought through, metro stations are themselves three to four story down. One of the reasons the famous Agrasenki Baudi in Delhi is dry is because of the metro stations which are three, four stories down and which pump out the aquifer water so that they are not flooded, right? So, therefore, our infrastructure, our roads, our metros, our basement parkings, our master plans are not talking to the aquifer. So what we are trying to do in Bangalore is to reverse that. We're saying, let's build a million wells, recharge wells. Let's protect this water. And every household should become responsible for 60 millimeters of rain. You know, If there's a rainfall of 60 millimeters, that site or that building should be responsible for it. It should not leave it go into the drain. It should push it into the aquifer. Now, if we do that, and if the aquifers are then used, balanced, we will not have urban flooding. So careful planning requires drainage, wetlands, lakes to be protected, but rainwater and aquifers also to be linked so that we use the aquifer as a buffer, as a bank to store during heavy rains and then use it when we need it, as a supplement when we need it. Right? So that has to be carefully crafted for every geology and locality. Mm -hmm. That kind of thinking is now emerging. I won't be critical of the past. Always new knowledge brings with it new insights. And we have to use these insights at scale to make sure that we do justice to our cities and we don't have urban flooding in water. Mm. And it's so, I don't know, it's pity actually because Bangalore was called the city of lakes. Uh, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the thing is not to go into nostalgia, but to create mm -hmm. a modern concept of what the lake should be. Right? Now mm. the lake um, uh, in Bangalore, which will feed the wells, will come from treated wastewater. 
they will not come from rainwater. They'll come with treated wastewater. So we'll have to reimagine lakes and how we're going to construct them, for what purpose they have to be built. And one of the purposes would be to recharge that to first so that wells have water. Mm-hmm. And, and is there any other backstory? Because, yeah, let's not get into the nostalgia part, but you see a lot of um, lakes um, in Bangalore. So were they designed keeping the whatever the 4,000 feet high yeah. so, topology? Yeah. There are two reasons why we built what are called tanks. No? We call them tanks. Uh, mm. This is because each one of them is artificially built. Mm. They're not natural lakes. Natural water bodies would be lakes. Artificial or human-made uh, water bodies would be tanks. So these are mm. tank systems. These tank systems are dated to be about 1,200 years old. 1,200 to 1,400 years old. We started to build these tanks. Perhaps they came from Sri Lanka because they're older there, two and a half thousand year old. Perhaps through the Cholas, the tank system came from Sri Lanka to India. Perhaps. Yeah, let's leave that history. But it was built because that was the only source of water. We had to hold on to the rain. It rained 30 to 40 days in a year, at best 60 days in a year. For the rest of the days in the year, we had to hold on to the water. So we threw an earthen dam or an earthen bund across a valley, held on to the water, allowed it to in, infiltrate into the ground, picked it up from the well as filtered water for drinking purpose. From the tank, we used it for irrigation purpose. But now what's happening is the role of irrigation is no longer existing in urban India. These tanks are not needed for the purpose that are built. So we have to find a new role for it. And unfortunately, what happened in the middle was wastewater or sewage started to come to these tanks and they became breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Malaria became a huge construct. Cholera became a huge problem. Plague became a problem. Late 1800s and malaria till 1960s, 1970s. So the tank themselves, which were meant for irrigation purpose, became new grounds for vector-borne diseases. So therefore, we had to get rid of it. So a lot of the tanks were destroyed. Were taken out because of this problem. We didn't deal with sewage together with uh, water. We didn't think of the vectors and we were densely populated. So now we have to reimagine them and bring them back. I'm not a nostalgist to say that all the thousand tanks of Bangalore should be brought back, but we should protect at least about 250 to 200, 300, so that an ecosystem is developed around it and we have ecological and cultural uses for it. Mm -hmm. But it seems like a cycle, right? Because uh, like, if I understand correctly, we have been an agriculture civilization for many years. While the first point which you mentioned about uh, the wells have sort of uh, manifested into today's industrial revolution. So, and, and the main reason for water depletion today is agriculture. So what, what has changed or like why? Uh, and it's, is it inevitable? Yeah, yeah. So technology is a relentless uh, machine, right? It, uh, the human being's quest for newer and newer technologies is in his DNA, is in her DNA, right? That's what we do. So we use the steam engine. The steam engine needed water for generating power. That power was used to transport water. In Bangalore, the first pipe water supply mm-hmm. schemes used steam engines to bring water from far away to itself, right? Then we developed the pump, the motor. Now we are capable of drilling 100 feet, 200 feet. Hard rock drilling rigs came from Denmark, USA, UK. We developed the technology of being able to drill to 2,000 feet for water now. Oil drilling, oil drilling rigs go even deeper. So we can dig deep, we can pump from deeper. We use diesel, fossil fuel to pump first. Now we use electricity to pump it. Electricity is generated from using water in thermal power plants, hydroelectric plants. And that same electricity is used to pump water out and then use it for agriculture and other purposes. Right? So what's called the water G or the water energy nexus. This is a relentless uh, development, which is consumption oriented. Now we are realizing the linearity of it is not going to work. So we are trying to make sure it becomes cyclic. So then the cyclicity in creating cycles of water, in creating cycles of energy, making sure that carbon cycles are respected and more carbon is sequestered than let out into the atmosphere will lie our salvation. Is it a bit too late? God knows. But should we put in the effort? For sure we should put in the effort. Where should we start? Start with a well. Start digging a well, putting rainwater in, recharging the aquifer, bringing the water up. Talking to the ground, talking to the aquifer, talking to the water, talking to rains. That's how we should begin. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, I'm frankly, like I'm, I'm more interested in knowing more things now. But uh, yeah, just to conclude, uh, I wanted to ask you, like, which you briefly touched upon just now, like what systems can be designed uh, in the current time? Yes, we are sort of falling back on or, or discovering this cyclical nature of things, but are there more nuances to this where we can maintain these water levels, especially in India? Any best practices one can follow at home or uh, in their places? 
Yeah, for sure. We have a lot of good practices. One of the good practices is a place called Hevre Bazaar, which is close to Pune, Ahmednagar district, where a sarpanch called Popotra Power, the villagers together, the Gram Panchayat, developed a system by which they would recharge, developing the forest, making contour trenches, putting water into the ground, and they put a ban on bore wells. They said no bore wells. But whatever water is in the well, we will share it. We will make sure that the water is distributed equally. One of the things with the well is that you should share the water with with people who do not have a well. Construct of the well is such that if you have a well in your house and I need drinking water, you'll never say no to me because you'll get punya, right? There's an RAC in heaven reserved for you if you give me water for drinking and cooking. So it may be a private property, but it's a community resource. Every bazaar has kept that as a community resource. It's made sure that every family has access to aquifer water, open well water, neighbors feel to the others, right? So sharing water, banning overuse of water, recharging water and living within the means. Every year, they sit together and decide how much has it rained, what crops should be grown. This year, the rains have been good, you can grow paddy. This year, the rains have been bad, only millets and flowers, right? So that kind of community actions, after understanding the aquifer, putting in efforts to make sure recharge happens, but then drawing out only that much which has been recharged that year by the rains. That's the balance that we seek. Every bazaar is an example. Chennai has been doing it. Bangalore is trying to do it. Cities and towns are trying to do it. Belgaum did it very nicely. There are good examples. We need to replicate them and we need to spread them as much mm-hmm. as possible. Mm-hmm. But again, then, like, who's going to decide that we have, because it, it, it won't be democratic, right? It is democratic. So decisions of water have to be democratic. Water for long has been treated as a private resource. If I have the money, I can dig a well or a borewell, I can draw as much as water as possible. Water in the dams has been decided as a state resource. Only the government has control on the dam water and the canal. But water, in a sense, is a common pool resource. So we have to create the nature of the common pool resource, understand it that it belongs to everybody, including non-human beings. And we have to decide water security plans at the lowest possible scale where it can be decided. And there's the famous Nobel Prize winning uh, economist called Eleanor Ostrom. She lays down 12 principles for the management of the commons, which includes drawing boundaries, developing community rules and respecting those community rules, but ensuring equity, ensuring that there is nobody deprived because of gender, caste, class or uh, creed, right? So that is the fundamentals of water. That is the fundamental lesson we have to learn from the well, that it provides. But please share the water equitably. Don't overuse, recharge, don't pollute, share. Mm. Awesome. I think, yeah, this is a good note to end this. I don't know. I'm, I'm short of words to conclude this also. I like um, Well, thanks, Kedar. But also one or two fascinating nuggets about it. Like you know, there's this famous example of cholera in London and John Snow, a famous uh, physician, identifying where were these cholera victims drawing their water from. And he did, created the first map, which is now called GIS mapping, right? Geographical Information Systems. But he did it then without GIS systems. He just mapped it. And by closing and removing the handle from the tank pump, a lot of the cholera deaths were avoided. So wow. mm-hmm. by putting science and knowledge to the business of aquifer and water and developing the human curiosity and intellect around it, we can solve issues of cholera, which we did. We solved issues of the guinea worm, which we've done, polio, which we've done, smallpox, which we've done, we've overcome. We now have to overcome the problem of fluoride and arsenic in our groundwater and water shortage globally, which if we act as a community, we can surely overcome. So we need to push that common pool resource and the community knowledge activity that we need to get to our younger generations. Yeah. And it's very much required, I think, because otherwise... We have to actually resort back to the Manu Vadars type people where you you consume all resources from one area and then you move on. Not that they are doing it. I'm saying the earlier ancient human did that. And maybe the invention of agriculture was a boon, but there have been some contrarian views also to that, that because of agriculture, there are these pandemics because there are people staying together. So, I mean, there is always going to be some trade-offs. I think just living with like good quality water and conserving it would be like probably the right balance. Well, actually the Manwater relationship with the family now is very strong, right? Every year they come in March and April and they make sure that the well that their fathers or forefathers have dug 
they come and see that well and they ask, should it be desilted? Should it be deepened? Should, should it be disinfected? They'll put alum, they'll put potassium permanganate, clean up the well, desilted, and the families recognize each other. This grandfather would have put that grandfather to the job of digging the well. The grandson and the granddaughter and the grandson here, they talk to each other, they make sure that the well is cleaned up, problems are identified and rectified, bandicoot holes are plugged, so on and so forth, right? So it's this human association which we need to develop and work on, right? It's not an artifact or a machine pumping water. It's a construct of human beings which has to be treated with care and with affection and with respect and with a lot of love and understanding. That's what the well signifies. Right? It's human bonds, human interface, how people do things, how people develop skills, how people use water, all that is tied together. That kind of human bonding is what we need to start to work on a lot more mm. in this era of WhatsApp. <laughs> Absolutely. I was watching one documentary uh, on Netflix and like one of the definitions of design is just one word, which is care. Do you care enough to design it well? <laughs> design it well also has a pun in it. Cool. Thanks, uh, sir, for giving your time. It was really, really wonderful talking to you. Uh, I wish to have you again on audio again, maybe talking about some other water structures and, and documenting that aspect of it. But yeah. thanks. Thanks a lot. Pleasure, Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. And that's it from today's GAN session. For show notes and more GAN, visit audiogan.com. If you like this podcast, please don't forget to check our other interesting podcast on IVM Network. You can listen to us on IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or any of your favorite podcasting apps. To stay tuned, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at IVM Podcast. And if you wish to connect with me, I am at Audiogan Moments on Instagram. Until then, take care. Habits, routines, how exactly do they help us get better? Well, to simplify it for you, tune in to the Habit Coach Podcast. I am Ashton Doctor and I am going to be here to help you get better daily with some simple, easy to do habits that you can easily adapt to your life. So tune in to the Habit Coach Podcast from Monday to Friday because I believe that awesome lives start with awesome habits. Have you ever wondered where the business world is headed? How the ways in which we create, market and sell to consumers will evolve? Or if we'll ever go back to wearing pants while working? For answers to all of this and more, tune into Advertising is Dead with me, Varun Dugirala. Every Tuesday, as I talk to entrepreneurs, leaders and change makers from across business, media, marketing and beyond, you can catch all episodes of Advertising is Dead on the IBM Podcast website, app or wherever you get your podcasts from.